If you've ever played Thug Pro online, you've probably come across people that have colors in their names and wondered how they do it. Well, Thug Pro has colors built in and they're really easy to use. All you do is press the backslash key twice and then C and you enter a number or a letter and there's 16 different combinations of those colors. The 16 colors that are there already work pretty well but it would be nice if there was a way to add your own custom colors or write text in any color that you wanted to begin with. So what if I told you that it was possible to get more colors? In fact, it's possible to get over 65,000 colors as opposed to 16 and I'll be showing you how I did that. So I've added full 16-bit colored support to Thug Pro, and it's really easy to use. All you have to do is press the backslash key twice, and press CC for custom colors, then enter a number between 0 and F for how red you want the color to be, another number for how green you want the color to be, another number for how blue you want the color to be, and then another number for the opacity of the color. 0 being completely transparent and invisible, and F being completely solid and opaque any of the text after this will have the color that you specified. At the end of this video I'll show you how you can install this. So when it came to designing the way that the colors were specified, there were a couple of considerations I had. The first one was that the colors should be short to write, and the reasoning for this is because people often want to put colors in their names, and you're not actually allowed that many characters when you're entering a username, so the less characters that the color formatting text up the better. Some other considerations that I had were that the colors had to be easy to understand, and I also wanted them to be very easy to pick with a color picker. In the previous mod corner video, we looked at using Cheat Engine to view the disassembly of Thug Pro, and it's actually possible to inject our own disassembly, and that's exactly how we're going to get the custom colors working. But before diving into that and writing a bunch of assembly code, I thought it would be easier to write the code in C++ so that I could get an idea of how it works and also so I could write a set of unit tests for my code. And if you don't know what unit tests are, unit tests are just a thing that developers can use to ensure that their code is doing what they expect by specifying the inputs and the outputs for certain pieces of code. So I began writing this color conversion algorithm that would convert my custom color text into a 32-bit color that would be understood by the game's engine. And to do that, I had to understand how the colors worked in the game. So I did a bit of research, and I found that the colors were represented as 32-bit numbers in ARGB format, which meant there was a byte for the alpha channel of the color, which is the transparency, the red channel, which is how red the color is, the green channel, and the blue channel, which adds up to 32 bits. To help me write the algorithm that would convert custom color text into a 32-bit color, I used a process called test-driven development, which is a useful technique that you can use to write code and unit tests side by side, and incrementally build up a solution to a difficult problem. And the way it works is you're constantly in this short feedback cycle called red-green refactor. In the red part of the cycle, you would specify an input and an output for the piece of code that you're testing, and then you would run the unit tests, and because you haven't written the code yet, it would fail. That's what the red stands for. The green part of the cycle is where you add the code that will make the unit test pass as simply as possible. So in this first example, all I did was test that 0000 would give me the color 0, which is just black and invisible. And it's always useful to start with these very simple test cases because they're the easiest to write. And all I had to do in order to make this test pass was to return 0 from my function. And the third step in the feedback cycle is refactor, which just means to clean up the code a little bit whenever you can. For this example, the code is already so simple that it's not really possible to clean it up anymore, but you'll see later when I start adding more test cases, there are quite a few benefits from cleaning up the code. And one of the nice things about test driven development is that because you have passing unit tests, you can modify the code and clean it up a bit, and then rerun the tests to verify that you didn't break anything. So at this point you might be thinking, why would you write one piece of code that just returns zero? Obviously that's not finished, that's not going to work for other numbers and for other colors, so why would you even do that in the first place? And I will admit it does seem very silly at first, but it's nice to be able to incrementally build a solution and verify that each little piece works and is tested at a time. So I went through here and I added a bunch more tests using the red-green refactor cycle, and eventually I came to a finished solution. And you may notice that some of the inputs and the outputs don't look exactly as you expect here, and that's for a number of reasons. Most notably, the color format is slightly different in this piece of code. Previously, when you were entering a color, I made it so that you would only enter digits from 0 to 9, but I figured that's a bit confusing. Why not go the full hexadecimal route and enter each digit between 0 and F, which is quite nice because it lets you interact with color pickers and so on. So some of the test cases might not look finalized here, but I'll show you the final code afterwards. 
Once I had a set of unit tests and some C++ code that implemented the color conversion function, all I had to do was port the code to x86 assembly. And one of the nice things about writing code in C++ is that the compiler often comes with the option to let you write inline assembly code. And that's nice because it means we can use our existing unit tests to let us verify the correctness of the code. When I originally started writing the code, I was writing it using Linux and GCC, which is a C or C++ compiler. And the inline assembly capabilities of the GCC compiler are absolutely fucking horrible. They are terrible. It's honestly terrible to write. But luckily Microsoft has their own version of the C++ compiler, which is a lot more usable and lets us write the code very easily. So I ported all the C++ code and the unit tests to work with Microsoft's compiler and started writing the x86 assembly. In the C++ code there was quite a few things that I'd never really worked with in assembly before, such as floating point calculations. And floating point numbers are just numbers that are real numbers, numbers with a decimal point. And working with those in assembly code is a little bit different to working with whole numbers like integers. And thankfully there was this fantastic guide online called Simply FPU, which walked through all the knowledge you need in order to perform floating point calculations in x86 assembly. Honestly, if you need to work with floats and you don't know how to do it, you need to read this. This is so good. And it took me a couple of days, but I eventually got the x86 implementation of the code working. Let's step through the various pieces of the code and show you what they do. So here's the C++ code, and you'll see here I have this function called color text to int, which converts a piece of text into an integer, which is going to represent the color. And you'll see this is done by looking at each of the characters. The character at the third index of the string is responsible for how red the color is. The character at the fourth index of the string is responsible for how green it is. Blue is the fifth and alpha is the sixth. And then I do this fancy calculation here where I convert each of these numbers into one 32-bit number and return it at the end. And this color digit to byte function is essentially mapping a number between 0 to f in hexadecimal to a number between 0 and 255 in decimal. And the reason we do this is so that we can access a wide range of colors. With this piece of code, the character 3 is going to become the number 3, the character 4 is going to become the number 4, the character A is going to become the number 10 in decimal, and the character F is going to become the number 15 in decimal. We convert our number to a float, then we divide that number by 16 and multiply it by 255, which is just these two numbers here. And this will correctly map any digit between 0 and F to a number between 0 and 255. And you'll see over here we have an identical piece of code written in x86 assembly. And it's quite a bit longer, but that's just because we don't have the nice terseness of C++ to help us write shorter code. We have our custom color text to int function, and we have our color digit to byte function. You'll see at the top we have some weird stuff here. If you've never seen assembly code before, or x86 assembly, this is just a way of setting up a thing called a stack frame, which you can kind of think of as some memory for your function to run in. So we've created 16 bytes of local memory and we've done some fancy gymnastics with some of our CPU registers so that we can return to the piece of code that called this function. And at the bottom here, we do some more stack frame gymnastics to restore the stack to its previous state. It's okay if you don't fully understand this code, I'm just going to give you the gist of what it does. Over here, I'm allocating some memory for local variables. The piece of memory at EBP-4 is going to be responsible for storing our red value. EBP-8 will have our green value. EBP-12 will have our blue value, and the same for the alpha. EBP minus 16. Here at EBP plus 8, I'm accessing a parameter to our function, which is text. The first thing that we do is we load the character at index 3 into memory, and then we push it onto the stack and we call our color digit to byte function. And once we've done that, we get the result, which is in EAX, and we move it back into our local memory, which is the red variable up here. And we do the same thing for each of the different colors. Then once we've done that, we go to the bottom here where we're doing some fancy bit shifting operations in order to convert all of these color variables into one color variable at the end. And at the very end, the color is moved into EAX and there's some stack gymnastics so that we can return to the previous color of the function. The color digit to byte function is also quite a bit longer. We have three local variables. Um, this says nine, that should actually be F, but... Uh, the comment was just wrong. By the way, that's why you don't write too many comments in your code, because they're prone to being outdated, whereas code itself cannot get outdated. 
and here we're moving the parameter of this function onto the CPU and we're doing some calculations with it. And you'll see we have different ways of converting the color digit to a byte depending on whether it's uppercase hexadecimal, lowercase hexadecimal, or decimal. So it runs one of these pieces of code. And then once it's done, we do some floating point calculations. And this is the stuff that required a bit of research. And here I'm loading the integer value of the character onto the floating point unit doing some division, I'm dividing by the maximum typed value, which is f, or 15, and then I'm multiplying the number by the maximum encoded value, which is 255. And once I'm done with that, I remove the value from the floating point unit back into RAM, and once it's in RAM, I move it into EAX, where it is returned for the color of the function. So now that I had this color conversion function working in x86 assembly, all I had to do was tweak the syntax a bit so it would work with Cheat Engine's assembler, and then inject various pieces of code into the executable so that it would run my custom color formatter when certain conditions were met. This is the piece of code that's responsible for rendering text on the screen. It does a bunch of stuff here, but the part we're interested in is the processing of fancy formatting characters. If it gets a backslash and a C, it does this stuff to calculate a color and place it into memory. And we're injecting some code in here that will decide whether or not we should run our custom color formatter or stick to the normal legacy colors. And here we are in IDA, and we're at the S text draw function. And here's the piece of code that's responsible for color formatting. Here's a check to see if we want to use color formatting or not. And if we do want to use color formatting and there's no color override, we execute this piece of code, which will give us one of the 16 legacy colors that are available in Thugbro and move it back into RAM at this address here. We want to inject some code here that will read the next character of our string to check if it's a C for custom colors. And we'll need to inject some code in here that says if we're using custom colors, then run our custom color formatting conversion thingy function and put the color into memory here. And here's all the code that does that. First, we're going to allocate two chunks of memory here, new mem0 and new mem1, which gives us some memory that we can put our code in. And here's the code that lets us decide if we're using custom colors or legacy colors. It loads your next character in your message onto the CPU. If it's a C, we know that we're using custom colors. Otherwise, we're just going to disable custom colors and work with legacy colors. Here we have the second piece of code we're injecting that checks if we should be using custom colors. And if we're not using custom colors, it just skips and, and runs the legacy color code. If we get here, then we load the next character of the string into the processor. If it's a zero, we don't want to use custom colors because this means that the user hasn't typed enough digits. Then we want to load the character for our red digit into memory and check if it's valid. We're going to call our isValidDigit function, which will either return a 1 if the digit is valid, or a 0 if the digit's not valid. If the digit isn't valid, we don't use custom colors. For the next digit, we do the same thing. We load it into memory, onto the processor. Then we call our isValidDigit function, and if it's not a valid digit, we don't use custom colors. Same thing again for the blue digit, and same thing again for alpha. And if we get to this point, we can jump to this label here which says to use the custom colors and this is the part where we call our custom color conversion function and store the result of that into memory because this is the color that we want to display the text as. And in here is just a bunch of code that I've copied from Ida. I probably don't need all of it but it's just for safety just to ensure that we're modifying as little as possible. And there's some slight differences here. Because we're moving the value of ECX back into our color variable, I've injected a, another line above this that loads the custom color that we calculated previously with our custom color conversion function into ECX. It loads it into ECX for us so that uh, the custom color is used. And then I add 4 to EBX, and because EBX is pointing to the characters in the string, it, that just means that I'm skipping over the color digits so they don't appear in the text. And after I've done that, I jump back into the process. Then we have some helper functions here. We have a function to check if a character is a valid digit. And below this, we have all the stuff we unit tested, like our color conversion function, custom color text to int, and our color digit to byte function. And finally, the last thing we have are the code injection points. And this is just where we're injecting these pieces of code into the Thug Pro process. So to use these custom colors, all you need to do is open Thug Pro, open Cheat Engine, open Thug Pro and Cheat Engine, go to your memory view, go to tools, auto assemble, paste the code in, execute. This code can be injected, are you sure? Click yes to inject our code. It doesn't matter if you click yes or no here, you can just click no. Um, just to demo this one, one more time, let's find a color picker. Oh, and by the way, I know that the word color with a U in it looks a bit weird. That's just the UK or Irish spelling of color as opposed to the American, which is color with an O. 
So if we go into our color picker, and let's say we want a nice deep purple, the hex code for this is A804AF, so we can type A O it. So here we go, backslash backslash, CC for custom colors, A O it, and then we choose how transparent we want it to be, or how opaque we want it to be rather, between 0 and F, F meaning fully opaque and 0 meaning invisible. I'm going to choose 9 so it's a little bit transparent but not too much. Actually you know what, I don't like that that much. Let's choose 5 or 3. Now we have a nice transparent color. And let's choose another color. What about a nice light green? Something like this. Yeah, I like that. The hex code is 64FF2B. So we'll, we'll take the 6, the F, and the 2. Backslash, backslash, CC, 6, F, 2. And then we'll choose a transparency. I'm going to pick 5. Wow, that looks... I really like that color. And there you go. We have another custom color. So this works fine and dandy for single player. If you try and use this online, anybody who hasn't injected the custom color code is just going to see a bunch of numbers in your text. So they might see something like 1234 hello 5678 world. But if this was ever added as an official feature of Thug Pro, everyone will be able to see the colors. Which kind of leads me to say, if the developers of Thug Pro think this is an interesting feature or something they'd like to add, I'd happily add it for them, although it would take a little bit of work. Um, and to be honest, I don't think they'd be that interested. But if you're one of the devs, you know, call me and we'll, <laughs> we'll work something out. All the code for this video should be in the description if you want to try it out for yourself. And let me know if you find any bugs or anything. I know I went quite fast in this episode and I apologize that I didn't really have time to explain the concepts very clearly. If you don't understand assembly code or C++, it's going to be very daunting to watch this video and try and grasp what's going on, but the code is all there and I tried to comment the assembly code to make it as readable as I could, and I tried to keep the setup instructions quite simple. So I hope you enjoyed watching and yeah, I'll see you another time. Alright, peace.